everyone. Um, thanks uh, all of you for, for joining. This is a great crowd. Um, my name is Sheila Donahue, founder of Vero. We go around the world seeking authentic farm to glass wines and olive oils from small producers, and we import them and sell them to businesses and consumers around the US. Our website is verovinogusto.com. And today we're honored to be in the company of uh, uh, Lorenzo Carino's son and daughter, Guido and Luisa, who are now the uh, sixth, sixth generation of vigneron winemakers of Case Corini in Piedmont, following their dad's uh, passing last November. We will be talking to them about having re uh, received the baton that was passed from their father who uh, was a prolific viticulture researcher and advocate of regeneration, re regenerative agriculture and natural wine. So I'm, um, and I'm personally just as touched to have Peter Nelson uh, with us. He's a Boston based Psalm and working soon to open up a restaurant. Um, and he in fact had um, moderated our last, uh, our last Vero talk with Lorenzo Carino and Guido, which was in May, 2020. So his knowledge and passion, not only of Lorenzo Carino, but the topics uh, that we'll be talking about are near and dear to his heart and his, his livelihood. Um, and then of course, we'll also be tasting um, Jose Corini wines, uh, uh, the, the late, one of their latest wines and uh, as well as the, the vintages of their, let's say, tried and true wines that we're familiar with. So again, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you, we're gonna, um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Peter, who's gonna be moderating, and we wanna make this interactive. So if you have any questions, just uh, feel free to, um, you know, either uh, write it in the chat or unmute yourself. So I'll turn it over to Peter. Uh, hello, everyone around the world. Uh, so I am Peter Nelson, and as uh, Sheila said, I'm due to open sometime uh, before October a uh, small wine and beer bar uh, in uh, Sullivan Square, Charlestown, Massachusetts. Um, so um, it, my career over the last 20 years has drawn me more and more and more to the kind of wines that uh, Lorenzo made and that... Um, that others like him uh, around Italy and the world uh, have made. And um, I'm thoroughly convinced that this really, uh, this, these are the wines that people should be drinking. There's no way around it. And um, I was, I was, Lorenzo was a dear friend. I, I don't even know, I met him so many years ago and then we kind of restruck up our friendship uh, maybe five years ago. And um, well, needless to say, I, I miss him. And uh, so on that note, um, obviously we, here we have the sixth generation people who are brother and sister who are uh, moving to carry on the legacy, not only of Lorenzo, but of the property. Um, the property uh, endures and endures through the spirits of those who have, who have been there before. And um, saying that, so to Guido and Luisa, um, a two part question, um, part one, um, your feelings about taking over, uh, filling such very large uh, footsteps. Um, and the second part, if you could, um, you know, tell us what about the winemaking that your, your dad developed, um, what, what makes that special for you? Yeah, uh, hi everyone, hello. Um, uh, oh, too, too big, uh, too big question. Uh, <laughs> first, uh, first, we, we, we would like to, to introduce uh, a little bit our um, small family farm. And uh, now we are, uh, me and my sister Luisa, working uh, after a, a very strong man, our father was. Uh, a very very good good uh, teacher about uh, uh, about this topic that we are talking uh, talking about natural wine uh, means many many different uh, things uh, our family our farm 
our um, way to make wine is uh, older than uh, natural wines. Um, to explain a little bit better, uh, I would like to introduce a little bit more our uh, story about this. And um, my sister, she can uh, help. She helped me about uh, a few few words about our story. Uh, so I give the the time to my sister. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, it's the first time for me. Uh, uh, I'm uh, very happy to introduce my family company to you. I'm sorry for my poor English. Uh, I'm, uh, but I'm trying uh, uh, to learn and uh, think this uh, a very good occasion uh, um, to improve myself. Um, my brother uh, Guido and me are the sixth uh, generation of winemakers uh, in Consiglio Ledazzi. Uh, the story uh, of our family uh, began uh, in uh, the middle of the 19th uh, century uh, when Corino Biagio, uh, our ancestor, uh, decided to uh, build the farmhouse in the place uh, where the company Case Corini uh, still stands today. Um, over the years, uh, the new generation uh, for their subsistence uh, have uh, maintained uh, uh, the polycultural activities uh, um, of the typical Piedmontese farm. Uh, we were uh, um, 19th, 17th, uh, uh, and uh, early uh, 1980s, uh, and have still uh, seen these uh, original attitudes with uh, our paternal grandfather. Um, um, just to, um, this is a very, very short introduction of our um, winery. Um, we, uh, we, we learn a lot from our father and our grandfather. Uh, we, we, never, uh, we never move from our typical uh, way to make uh, wine. And um, I remember very well when my father was talking about uh, the, the story of the, um, Oh, oh, the story of uh, of the life, and he start learning about uh, wines from the father, like me and like uh, my my sister, and uh, this is the very very um, it's a very important uh, uh, things for us. Uh, we would like to keep this kind of uh, tradition that is the the, the best way uh, to respect the effort of our ancestor. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe we forgot uh, many things that we <laughs> we, we ask. Uh, sorry, Peter. No, no, no problem. Um, that was awesome. Um, that was an awesome answer. Um, so uh, Nilda is uh, sort of the first new wine in a long time, correct? Sorry, Nilda. Nilda, it's a new, it's a new wine. Yeah, is a is a new is a new blend, not a blend, is a field blend. So, yeah. um, can you name some of the other varieties in addition to Barbera? Yeah, uh, our our vineyard are very complexly complex. Um, there are a lot of uh, variety inside of the the vineyard, like the old style. Um, tradition like our tradition, and uh, we start uh, making Nilda um, 1919 uh, in the 19, uh, collecting the the first grapes that are ready from different places. Um, our um, our goal is to to make 
a, a, a good wine with grapes that are not ready to be very, very ripe. And the variety are, are mainly Barbera and after uh, Grignolino and, uh, and Dolcetto mainly. But the 80% is Barbera. Okay. And um, so you, so these are younger vines mainly? Yeah, exactly. And so are they, there's, but they're contained within your larger vineyards. Yeah, so they, the grapes, they, they come from mainly from the vineyard called Achille, Barla, and Brico. Okay, all right. And yeah. then, um, okay, so we should, uh, we should, everyone should uh, get their, their nose uh, into the wine and uh, start to taste it. And um, I think that um, as we move through the wines, how Nilda is different uh, will become apparent. Um, as we taste through more wines, we'll see in retrospect where you can uh, Monday morning quarterback it. Um, how um, the winemaking, I noticed in your, in your uh, documents online, say that it uh, basically undergoes the uh, same treatment as your other wines. Can you tell us why that is? You know, uh, six or seven weeks maceration, 36 yeah. months old wood. We, we, we start our very, very important moment is the harvest where we select the grapes. Uh, and after the selection, we keep it uh, in the box uh, for uh, a week. And after we crush, we take out the steam and uh, the fermentation and the maturation is in wooden barrel, big wooden barrel. Um, uh, not, mm, the fermentation starts naturally, obviously, and the maceration, uh, we keep it on the skin uh, around uh, one month, one month and a half for Nilda. The other, uh, the other cuvee change a little bit more or less, depend on the quality of the grapes. Uh, after the maceration, uh, we we open the barrel and uh, we, we we fill in in another barrel and and after we will bottle nilda around one one year one year and a half later okay um, does anyone care to share comments on this wine its nose its texture its mouthfeel its taste jump in anybody a beautiful vibrancy and really nice texture. Just like that cr classic crunchy note, right? And you've got um, really nice deep dark fruit. I mean, this is this is a really nice wine here. Yeah, great texture. Lots of cherry and bramble on the nose, sour crab and apple. Fresh, very fresh. Thank you, Noel. Anybody else? Um, so I don't want to do go too because I have tasted through the wines and many of you may not have tasted them already. I opened them up a little earlier, you know, to make sure they were ready to go. Um, but I think that um, everyone should really put a firm sort of stamp in their tasting brain uh, what what you're experiencing with this wine because you'll see as we move along we'll see the difference. Um, I do have one question for you, Guido. Um, so, yeah. uh, for, uh, uh, trellising, um, you use, um, uh, espalier and some pergola. What, why, what is the, are you doing the same and some, uh, uh, goblet, bush prune, uh, the new, uh, vines, do you decide right away how to trellis them or do you wait for them to grow a bit? I mean, what is your plan for the new vines? Uh, the, the plan is follow, is follow the, 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 the life of the plant. At the beginning of the life of the plant, you, you should grow a little bit a little bit from the soil. So uh, at the beginning, the, the gobelet is not uh, the, the best way to prune. 
Uh, but first of all, it's very, very important uh, um, look at the plant. And with uh, our experience, uh, um, try to, to respect the life of the plant. Um, I, I know that is not uh, too, so easy to, to, to explain by words. Um, it's better walking in the, in the fields, in the, in the lines and the show, uh, show the, some example, uh, because inside of one vineyard, there are uh, hundred and hundred different uh, uh, kind of life from the, the, the plant. Um, we, we, I, we, we respect the, um, the, the body of the plant. And to do this, uh, we, we have to, to know really well how the plant works. And uh, my father for us was a very, very good teacher about this because uh, uh, I, I start working in the vineyard, uh, in <laughs> pruning. Uh, my, my, my first job was very, very hard to, to my, my father was very serious with me and uh, he started uh, uh, teach me something very, very hard because it's one of the most important moment uh, for us because we decide uh, not just the, 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 the one year, but we decide the life of the plant in the moment when we prune. Okay, and then um, a loaded, uh, a loaded question. Um, and excuse me for asking it, but uh, are you are you using um, American rootstocks or developed yeah. rootstocks? Yep. Yeah. All right. Use uh, we plant uh, American rootstock. We grow the plant uh, for four, five, four, five years, and after graft in the lines, uh, we we select the buds from the the best uh, plant, and we we graft inside of the fields. All right, all right. We try to 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 decide. We try to yeah to to do the best selection of our best plant uh, for two reason. First of all, uh, we believe in the in the in the life of the plant. In the historically, that kind of plant are already. Um, uh, already get used to live in our place. And uh, second is that uh, if we introduce a new variety, not new variety, but a new, a new plant from uh, nursery, we change as well the, the taste of the wine. We, we, we believe to, to, to this. It's a very a big effort for us because instead of changing plant, uh, we put a rootstock and after uh, something wrong. <laughs> and after uh, 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 graft, uh, it takes a long time, is uh, definitely expensive, the exp more expensive than planting new wine. New... Okay. Um, and then uh, before we leave, Nilda, uh, can you tell us um, about the name? <laughs> The name is a very simple story. We are used to uh, put um, a name uh, not from the fantasy, but uh, all of the, uh, all of the, the, the bottles uh, are a specific. Uh, there is a specific idea idea uh, about. And Nilda was the nickname of our grandmother. So the mother of our father. And uh, she was very, very important for us and for, uh, for my father as well, because uh, she spent uh, uh, most of the life uh, looking uh, after the house where we are now and uh, the cellar as well. So it was a very, very uh, important for us. All right. So um, everybody who has the wine should... Um for the next one, which is um, Achille. Um, here, 6040 Barbera Nebbiolo, uh, vines planted in the 50s, uh, similar, similar winemaking. Um, something I'd like to touch on now, um, 
and uh, in appreciation to Sheila for providing an excellent uh, sort of guide. Um, so what strikes, what struck me most, so when Noel and I last saw um, your dad um, at Raw in New York, um, he gave me his book. And while I knew he was um, a great winemaker because I, well, drank the wines and a great grower of grapes, obviously, um, I also learned that he's uh, quite the scholar, um, quite the academic, holding multiple, multiple positions in various uh, organizations, uh, agricultural, enological, viticultural, all these sorts of things. Um, have you plans to continue that part of the tradition as well? Uh, uh, I, 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 we did a, a different study. Uh, our father was an agronomist and uh, very involved in the research. Uh, he teaches us many things about uh, wine, about uh, soil, about natural uh, life. Um, me and my sister, uh, we did different study. I'm uh, an architect for example, and uh, for this main reason, uh, I learned something different instead of my, my father. In my idea, our idea is to keep this uh, part of communication because we believe a lot uh, in, this, uh, in this area, in this, uh, in this topic. Uh, we know that the wine is a good friends uh, to introduce different uh, uh, different um, things, different topics. Um, I'm more uh, I'm more interesting and I'm more ready to landscape is more close uh, is closer uh, to my um, to my area. Um, for this reason, and not just for this, we are keeping and we are learning uh, a lot of things uh, from the scientific book and from the the idea of my of my father. Uh, we would like, uh, we would like, uh, we 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 are we are trying to to keep alive this part of our uh, important uh, part of my family. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I'm not. A sh I'm. I'm not. Uh, me and my sister. We are not uh, agronomists, so we we can't uh, talk about uh, soil like uh, in the scientific way. Excellent. Excellent. So um, first, uh, we'll get it out of the way. Achille, where does that name come from? The name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the name was uh, our uh, was um, our neighbor. Uh, the 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 field, the, the vineyard we call it many many years ago, the Vigna of Achille. And Achille was the the old owner of the vineyard, and he was a very very clever uh, farmer. He he was one of the first in the area of Costigliole that introduced uh, the Nebbiolo inside of the lines. And uh, when my father decided to, to do this blend, uh, we decided to put the name of him. That's that's excellent. Yeah, uh, and you can see the the the, the just the view from the vineyard. And uh, Achille was a very very um, clever to to decide to change from Barbera to Nebbiolo just in the part of the, the the parcel of the field where the Barbera doesn't grow very well hmm. because the best the best things to to follow to make a natural wine is uh, uh, respect the soil uh, if, uh, and uh, the field blend sometimes is is the best way to to respect the soil and uh, do natural and healthy wines. Is this a field wine not? Well, it's from the same okay. vineyard, but so a combination. Okay, so um, 
there's a lot of um, there's a lot of there's a lot of topics that are uh, popular. Let's say. Let's say. Uh, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of um, popular topics in uh, in wine growing uh, these days, um, which uh, partly, uh, no doubt, a response to uh, um, the changing climate. Um, but also to um, not not even just in in growing grapes, where it seems so many of the modern ideas about farming uh, sprout from, um, which are actually ancient uh, ideas about farming, um, and that of course is regenerative um, agriculture, um, etc. But before I would like you to to talk about that a little bit. But um, as a lead in, if you could, uh, can you talk about um, disease pressure uh, in your vineyards? And um, do you see a change in uh, one way or another um, due to uh, a warming climate? Uh, our, our memory is very, very short in my, in my opinion. Uh, obviously, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, we are living in a very, very hot moment of our, uh, of our life. And uh, I, we, we, to explain a little bit more about the climate and the, the average of our region, we, I, I'm used to... to um, to speak about not one, two, but at least 10 years. Um, 10 years is a, good, uh, is a good moment to talk uh, uh, about the, the, the variability of the weather. And uh, generally speaking, in 10 years, you can, uh, you can have uh, two, three good uh, uh, vintage for the vineyard. Uh, you can lose... Uh, one at least one year totally or the 50 percent of the production and the other vintage are there in the average uh, in the last 10 years uh, this kind of rules was was like this in uh, 2012 was normal 13 was a little bit better 14 was a disaster 15 was very very good 17 was uh, very hot 18 was really, really, really rainy. So in my opinion, the, the climate is changing because we are working too much against the climate, uh, too much. Um, so the, the, we, we are joking about the CO2 in this moment. And uh, the introduction of the CO2 like, uh, in this moment, uh, never happens when the human, since the human were on the on the heart. In my opinion, obviously everything can change uh, in one second because our big big star is the sun, and uh, tomorrow can be the last one. I don't know. We we really don't know about this. Um, coming back to the vineyard system, uh, the vineyard they can survive. Uh, they can survive in a very, very hot place. The story of the vineyard are in a place where the, 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 the weather is always really hot and really dry. Uh, if we move from this uh, area, uh, we introduce in the vineyard a lot of pathogen, a lot of problem. We, now we know how um, fight against these uh, pathogens, but the but the origin of the vineyard is in the very very hot places. Uh, to mm, to survive or to uh, to work with the nature as well now that uh, the climate is changing, uh, we we in my opinion we have to respect uh, uh, two things: the soil. That is the the real um, is the, the I yeah is one of the most important things 
not just for the vineyard, but for the agriculture. And second thing is the genetic of the vineyard. Uh, we, we should respect the, um, the indigenous variety. Introducing new variety means uh, make a, um, make a, uh, I'll say, uh, make a, a guess, a, a bet, sorry, a bit, bet, sorry. No problem. Yeah. All right. Um, everybody, somebody other than uh, Noel, uh, <laughs> would anyone care to uh, share uh, thoughts about this wine? And um, in terms of uh, the organoleptic uh, characteristics, um, and if anyone is so bold, uh, perhaps to compare um, the difference uh, between the two, and not so much in terms of extract or intensity, but in um, more subtle, um, more subtle differences. Anyone gonna jump in here? I'll jump in. I, I wanna, All right. Uh, I want to ask some more questions too. Yeah. But uh, the contrast is quite, uh, quite dramatic. There's not, actually nothing subtle about the difference. I think. Um, Milda is um, based on what uh, Guido said, seems to be a wine that is exactly what it's supposed to be, bright and young and fresh um, uh, and uh, uh, vibrant, I think was uh, what that, that came across. Um, Achille is uh, a wine of, of much greater depth um, uh, and concentration without being overly so. Um, it's a fascinating blend. Uh, I can't say that I've had Barbara Nebbiolo blends that often, if, if ever, <laughs> in my memory. Um, so, um, and, and the balance between the two is, is extraordinary. And it's also fascinating to me that Achille, the previous owner of the vineyard, understood uh, that there was a portion of, of, of uh, of that vineyard where Nebbiolo would thrive. And so it clearly is, is translated in, into the wine itself. So very, it's fascinating. So my questions though are, you said Guido that uh, 2018 was, uh, was uh, rainy, yes? Yes. So um, how, how um, so would that, would, would that be described as perhaps you know, not not necessarily excellent conditions, correct? So uh, yeah. I'm curious to you that, you know, for you as a winemaker, do you enjoy the challenge of crafting a wine in such a vintage? And how did you get such a good wine in such a vintage that was not so good? Yeah, good, good question. And then uh, I have more questions. And then I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> No, is um, um, yeah. The, the challenge when the, the season is not uh, is not perfect. It's not good. Um, good means uh, healthy for the plant. Uh, for me, for our style, for, for our philosophy. But when the rain is come, is is always come. Is <laughs> is is a good thing. Not for the plant, but for the roots. Uh, so we we we, appre we appreciate a lot the rain as well when the the season is not uh, not anymore the best uh, for us. Um, there is this, um, doing blend like Barbera and Nebbiolo, like Achille, uh, is a good solution when the, the <laughs> when the season is not perfect. Uh, because the difference between Barbera and Nebbiolo are very, very huge. Nebbiolo is more uh, strong against the humidity and uh, rain. Barbera is better when the, 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 the soil is more uh, dry and the weather is more hot. So <laughs> when the, the season is too hot, uh, the Barbera helps uh, Nebbiolo. And uh, <clears throat> when the, the season is too dry, is too wet, Nebbiolo helps a lot Barbera. The tan, this, the tan instructor helps a lot the acidity of the Barbera. And um, 
for this reason, when the season is not perfect, like uh, 2014, 2018, we, uh, our production of the blend uh, increase a lot because we believe in the mono variety, but just when the mono variety is perfect. If the biolo is not okay, we prefer doing the blend and respect that the, the season was not uh, enough, was not uh, strong enough to, to reach the top uh, uh, of the ripeness of the Barbera or Nebbiolo. All right, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, the, the reason that I like this sort of wine is because I can tell uh, just upon putting my nose to the glass um, that, um, that the wine is alive, okay? Uh, for me, um, this is the single most important element. Um, you know, <clears throat> and this, these wines are alive. Uh, they're, of that, there, there, can be, there can be no question. And um, the big difference and the difference that, or the way that I describe it to people who are less familiar um, with wines made in this fashion, um, is that uh, a conventionally made wine, you know, a typical wine that is not overly manipulated, but still involves sulfur, involves um, inoculation of yeast, et cetera. Um, those wines are sort of, when you open up it, even though it may evolve in the glass, and um, it's sort of like a snapshot, okay? Everything, the sulfur locks everything in place and it's almost immovable. Okay, it, it slows down oxidation, it does kill things, what have you, but you know, it just sort of, it stops the wine in its tracks and only over a significant period of time, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> are you able, does the wine do anything? Whereas in a, a wine like yours, um, they're living. It's like, a, it's like a cauldron, you know? All these things are constantly coming out and it's changing and growing naturally, not just through the process of oxidation, but just through this living quality that it has. And especially when, when pairing with food, you know, I mean, we don't, unless you eat a lot of apricots, you know, we don't cook our broccoli and then spray it with a bunch of sulfur, right? you know, to keep that one flavor at that one moment, we don't do that. We eat broccoli or any vegetable or any food, you know, we eat it and it's still going. There's still something happening with that food. And so putting these wines with that, with food is, it's just a natural, a natural thing to do. And I hate to use the word natural over and over again, but it really is, okay? It really, it really, really is. The wine is alive. Um, so um, before we head to the next wine, the, for me, um, the subtle difference between the two wines um, is there seems to be a touch more volatility, volatility in the Nilda. And um, I, I sort of broached the topic of disease pressure earlier. Um, what, it, uh, what do you think of what I just said? And I'm, yes. not, a, I'm not against volatility. Yeah, I'm, yeah, no. Um, uh, less structure, more uh, volatile. In my, in my, my, my idea about the volatile that we, we try every year to work uh, in the best way. <clears throat> Uh, we never use uh, sulfite, we never use uh, uh, additives to, to, to stop uh, the volatile. And uh, working this way means uh, collect very, very good grapes, healthy grapes. Uh, at the same time, sir, if the structure of the grapes are, is not huge, the volatile works uh, a little bit more. The alcohol and the complexity of the wine, um, confusing a little bit sometimes the volatile. Um, 
I, I believe uh, in the natural wine, like uh, uh, live wines. And sometimes volatile helps a lot to drink this kind of wines. So I agree 100% um, with what you just said. Um, I personally am not afraid of volatility. And you know, I learned maybe not to love volatility, but at least to no. appreciate it from uh, from the wines of uh, Beaujolais, you know, where the natural wine weirdness of France sort of began, even though your family was making natural wine before Marcel and probably a media <laughs> Pepe as well. Uh, and uh, maybe Valentini, who knows, in Abruzzo. Um, so it's funny because, you know, those wines never came to this country, okay? Uh, Marcel Lapierre, um, unsulfured Beaujolais Morgon didn't come here until like the mid 2000s. Um, but there was always that little bit. And in a, in a, in a fruit forward wine like Beaujolais, um, that little bit of volatility helps. And I think the Nilda personally benefits from that just tiny touch of volatility. Um, it gives the wine a sort of a, I don't use a word that you don't know, uh, sprightly, you know, kind of like just kind of, you know, dances along the tongue and dances across the palate. Um, okay, so our next wine um, is going to be uh, the Barla and, um, what's that? I mean, the Chentin, Chentin, pardon me. Um, and uh, that's named for your grandfather? Uh, the Chentin is a, is our, is a dialect, is the nickname of the uh, grandfather of my father. So it was my grand grandfather, Vincenzo the name, but in uh, dialect is uh, Vincenzin Chentin. Ah, okay. Chentin. All right, Nick and so, yep, go ahead. Where'd you go? All right. Oh. Oh, I didn't point it for myself. <laughs> Silly rabbit. <clears throat> you guys having fun? You got any things? Okay, so. This is the 100% Nebbiolo. Uh, most vines also um, uh, planted in the 50s, uh, the same uh, six week or so maceration period with the letting them hang out for a week first and then the mess, et cetera. And then, um, and then the 36 months or so in, uh, in the old oak barrels before um, bottling. Um, Technical detail. <laughs> Have you any other? Uh, so on this wine, um, so I personally believe that um, just like everyone else, I have veins and arteries. Okay, and as we all know, veins uh, go to the heart to pick up oxygen and bring to the body, and then the arteries take the blood that has the oxygen and spreads it to the body. Um, so for me, uh, my veins are uh, flowing with uh, Pinot Noir and uh, my arteries are flowing with Nebbiolo. Um, I believe Nebbiolo is to be a, a life force. Um, I'm gonna try not to be too spiritual on you, on you people. Um, <laughs> so um, the, 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 the main question I have um, about this wine um, is uh, the similar questions to the others. Uh, the, the period of time um, that they macerate, you know, the, the post-fermentation maceration. Can you just, for this wine in particular, go into more detail why um, it is as long as it is? 
Um, why? Um, uh, bar, um, this wine and the next one, Barla, uh, they are the our two best uh, cuvée. So where we are, we try to 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 work uh, in the in the best way every year. So this is our first selection of Nebbioli, and uh, when we we um, we collect uh, the 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 best uh, grapes. Uh, we, we believe that the, the, the most important things to extract from these grapes uh, come from the, the skin. And to do this, uh, we, we keep uh, the maturation as long as we can. And uh, vintage like uh, 18, we, we collect a very, very few grapes to, to do this chentin. But we prefer to uh, do small production, especially when the season is not good, but keep uh, these uh, rules. So uh, our imp most important rules is uh, uh, respect the extraction of the grapes. And to do this, uh, the maturation is really, really important. When we, we, we keep together uh, wine and grapes, uh, uh, we believe that uh, the, one of the most important things uh, is between the, the wine and, the, and the, the life between the, the, the wine and the grapes together to, to reach the most important things for us, so the harmony of the, the wine. All right, and then... Um... I hope everyone has uh, been sniffing and tasting this wine. <clears throat> uh, definitely um, different uh, elements here. Um, I'm going to ask, um, I hope not too sensitive a question. So um, you pick later uh, than perhaps someone in, um, and Barolo might, okay. Um, yeah. You're also right. Would that yeah, be true? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we we the Barolo we pick it uh, from the middle of October. Okay. So you pick later, which means you're going to have greater ripeness. Um, you're also um, dealing with a warmer climate. All right. And um, so you're. Sugar, one can guess, perhaps, uh, that sugar elevate sugar levels are elevated. So yes. uh, my question is less a, is less a question, but more a statement that you're welcome to answer in any way you like. Um, the alcohol on these wines uh, is fifteen point five percent. I find them very digestible, but they are 15.5%. And now having tasted Nilda and Achille, um, there is certainly a small amount of residual sugar. What would, how would you comment on that? Any of that? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> there is no, no, no perfect answer. Yeah, I mean, no, I'm we, sure. We, we believe more in the complexity of the ripeness than in the sugar. So we believe that the sugar uh, at the end of uh, September, when the, the, during the day the temperature are really, really high, is stopped to grow. So the quantity of the sugar now, really now this year, in this, uh, is uh, reaching the top, the top. Until. Yeah. But the, the complexity, I mean, the structure of the, the, the grapes need more time. I do one example. Uh, the best flower uh, are in the mountain. The best color of the flower are not in the flat place or the, in the hilly place, but are in the mountain or during the, the beginning of the spring in the hilly place. Um, this example is to explain that uh, the lower temperature at night, so the, scar the excursion of the temperature from the day at and the night is very important 
to uh, to reach more uh, fresh freshness and uh, intensity. Do do you understand the? Yes, the, yes the, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. For this reason, uh, we we wait uh, for the harvest uh, since uh, when the, the the night are cooler. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And right. uh, yeah, if we if the the alcohol is high, <laughs> we we can't uh, <laughs> we can do nothing about this. Is our best way to to conserve the wine for each uh, the, this kind of uh, alcohol. Uh, we know that is uh, the, the market in this moment is looking for a different kind of uh, wines sometimes, but uh, we we prefer every year. Uh, uh, reach this kind of ripeness when it's possible, obviously. Yep. All right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to break the mold here uh, and offer some of my um, my comments. I think we have enough wines where I can kind of generalize over them. Um, and I hope everyone's taking notes because uh, you want to taste these wines again in a couple of hours, maybe tomorrow maybe over the weekend um you know to see to see that the wines are alive um and to see i mean i've had going way back very very early version i think of maybe or back when they weren't even had names the wines were just a bottle then you knew it was barbera um the, drink the wine after three days and and have it still be brilliant to this day as a wine buyer um, especially for wines I'm going to offer by the glass, or if it's in retail for people who just have a glass or two of wine and the bottle may last more than a couple of days, I give it the three day test. It's how I know if the wine has real soul inside and how I know that if I have a half a bottle left over at the end of service, I have full confidence in pouring it the next day. Um, these wines always pass. Um, but comments I would make on certain aromas um, and certain flavors in the wines. Um, the, and I'll start with, with um, aromas. The, uh, the, the, the Nilda, I think we've covered pretty well, um, but uh, the Achille um, is obviously the elder sibling um, because it's all that the Nilda has, but more. And the change and then just the nature of the dark fruit tones <clears throat> kind of wavers back and forth, you know, through the red berries, but also into the, the blue, bluish black berries. And it just goes back and forth. Each time you, you nose it, you get a different thing, but also um, something which after tasting um, the Gentine suggests it's the Nebbiolo, but this Asian five spice component, um, sort of is sneaking in there and licorice. There are so many different things and they they go and then they come back. Um, I think that uh, most, uh, and then moving on to the Achille in particular, I think that most people uh, familiar with um, Nebbiolo at any level or price point, um, I think that they're going to wreck if they're really paying attention They'll recognize the the neb you'll, they'll recognize this for Nebbiolo um, in the finish. Um, the finish screams Nebbiolo to me. Aromatically, uh, it's a slightly reductive, but not a problem. Now that it's been open, it shows more, and it seems it seems from my tasting earlier today that it has shed some of the, the boisterous baby kind of fruit and is showing more of the kind of thing you're talking about in, in terms of com complexity and, and different layers of, uh, of flavor and aroma. Does anyone want to add anything to what I just said? I have one uh, suggestion for you, Peter. I have, a, I have another question. Uh, Guido, again, uh, sort of dialing back to your description of uh, the 10-year cycle. Um, 
and how and how you observe climate. And you seem to comment that what's and what in the past was fairly consistent now, the only thing that's consistent is that it's inconsistent. It's just all over the place. Is that is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I lost the part of the well, because the connection is not is not good. Well, Sorry. Yeah. You... So so I, I asked you. You had described uh, yeah the, the, as, as, the as, as, a, as a as a as a as a farmer as a as a as a winemaker that you observe weather patterns in a, a in vintages in a ten year cycle. Yeah. And that in the past. You know, each ten-year cycle is fairly consistent, fairly. But now, the ten-year cycle is you're seeing greater inconsistency. It's not just heat, um, but heat is certainly a part of it. Um, and so, sort of referencing Peter in terms of alcohol levels, in, in I, I think the the Chantin's totally balanced. Uh, I understand. Uh, your decision to harvest later and 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 all of that, but yeah, what do you what do you predict in terms of particularly with heat? What do you predict in terms of phenolic development and ripeness? How how is this going to change? Uh, how is this going to change uh, your viticulture and your wine? Yeah, uh, is <laughs> I have no answer about this. I can I can uh, I can share my idea about this. Yeah. Uh, um, many many producers they are trying to to move the production in a cooler place, uh, waiting for the the sun as well uh, in the mountain or in the more high hill around the Haz. I I. I, I don't know. I mean, um, the, the the weather and the climate is is only one of the things that our uh, our job uh, have to yeah. to 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 know. Uh, the soil is as well more in, is very important. Uh, the, the soil, the climate, and the, our uh, idea, our philosophy of the of uh, our style of work uh, we we can uh, we can change uh, we can change our uh, idea so we can move uh, to a different um, style of different way to work introduce more um, more organic matter inside of the of the fields can help the soil to 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 improve to to improve the, the structure, um, but there is we we have no solution. If the the, the weather change in uh, change uh, very very quickly, we we should uh, decide to do something. And if the viticulture is not any more affordable in our place, we we will see the story. Uh, teach us a different story. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the viticulture is uh, is working and is affordable for us in our area since uh, many many century, and uh, we don't know the weather uh, of our area 250 years ago. We have no idea about this. I think that. Uh, uh, what we can do against the climate changing in the respect to the, the, the main rules uh, that uh, we know, we know very well, uh, protect the soil, work but not work too much, and uh, never waste water is very important. I'm not afraid about the climate changing, I'm more afraid about the, the the water. I mean, we are losing uh, soil and water every year, and this is, in my opinion, in the in the short short time, mm. is uh, is going to be a big problem. The water more than the climate changing. Uh, huh. 
the erosion, we are losing the, the, the very, very important, the most important part of our terroir every year. There is no, the people is not, uh, they are not uh, uh, ready maybe. They, they, they really, they, they don't know. They are working too much with the soil. And they, they are, I'm sure that they, they are, they are doing the best, but they are doing in the, 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 the opposite of the best. Uh, the picture that on this is, uh, is online now, and is on the screen now. Uh, we can talk for one year about this. Uh, on the right side, there is a, a, a big uh, step. Uh, the two sides, they were together on the same level. But uh, the right side, we stopped to do viticulture with the mechanization. In the left side, the, mechanic the mechanization worked for more than 40 years. Now we can see the difference between uh, the level of the soil. All the soil that, uh, was, that we lost on the left side yeah. is uh, in the river now. And uh, everybody of us, uh, we know that uh, the most important uh, part of the soil, the most important uh, uh, part for the plant is the, is the first uh, layer of the soil. If every year we lose the first uh, layer, we lose uh, a part of our landscape, a part of our life. And we, we, <laughs> we, we work to, to change the, 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 the structure of the, the river and at the end of the sea as well, because the, the, the water wash the soil. And to work better in this direction is very easy. Introduce grass inside of the line. It's very, very easy. So, Works so less. Guido, yeah, so Guido, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is so obvious, so obvious just from this picture. I mean, we, we all can see it. Your neighbors see it, yes? Yeah. Do, and do they, you know, they who, who have been farming mechanically, uh, there are less flattering ways to describe what, what the vines are doing. Uh, are they starting to say maybe we should, maybe we should change? Uh, yeah, there is a small part of the farmer that they are thinking about uh, of this, mainly the, the youngest. But to change the idea is, uh, is very important. Uh, moving yeah. from the countryside to the university is moving from the, 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 the farm to, to change uh, idea. I mean, following uh, the, the tradition uh, means sometimes uh, uh, fly away uh, and uh, uh, introduce uh, something new as well. Be, be stuck in the countryside is the first uh, problem of our area. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, so one of the things that, um, that strikes me about all the wines um, are their, their structure. Um, you know, when I teach wine, I, I tell people, that um, alcohol and acid, they are the components in different measures that lend the body to the wine. Um, if you have the same alcohol level and higher acidity, the higher acidity wine will seem lighter, all right? If you have the same acidity and uh, you have a wine with higher alcohol, that's gonna feel like it has more body. It's gonna feel uh, fuller. And then when I try to sell wines that are digestible, all right, that are well balanced, but they're not dark or they're not thick or they're not heavy, all right? Um, I try to explain to them that the wine offers something else. It offers its extract and the interplay of the, um, the different compounds and components of the wine, the things that started with the grape, the things that are a product of fermentation, perhaps a product of time spent in the barrel. 
um, what I really, um, what I really uh, enjoy most about um, the wines is uh, the acidity is for me in the right balance, but more importantly um, are the tannins. Um, I have been known to describe Nebbiolo tannins as being like a sheet. So imagine your grandmother puts the sheets out to dry. They're all wet and it's blowing. The wind is blowing and the sheets are flapping and a big gust comes and you're standing there and it blows the sheet and it wraps you up like this. That's how I describe uh, Nebbiolo tannin. And I find that these wines have that. And I find that why I said earlier in the finish, I think that's really where the, um, the Centine shows um, it's Nebbiolo. And I think uh, the same um, can be said for the, for the Achaic. But what is most remarkable to me um, is the, the similarity in the texture of the tannins on the palate, the tactile quality of the tannins um, in the Barbera, the Barla, to the other wines. Um, have you any thoughts on that? Oh, hi. Oh, he's tasting. All right. So I repeat the question is for me or for everybody? Um, it can be for you since no one else really likes <laughs> answering the questions here. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I, and the reason I, I asked that question, the reason I asked that question um, is because I'm curious to know whether you uh, have a library of older wines. So, yeah. Uh, for the tannin, in, I, I'm not a sommelier. <laughs> I mean, I like, uh, I like wine. I like the taste of the wine and uh, I like uh, the acidity, I like the tannin, I like the structure, the color, I like many of this kind of element. And uh, in my opinion is, uh, first of all, is a question of time. Uh, the tannins sometimes need uh, more time than the acidity to be balanced. And uh, I, I, I never believe in the wine where uh, just one element is too high. And in the, the best and the natural way to reach the balance between the, the element is be patient. We, we don't believe in the analysis in our cellar. We believe more in the testing and uh, we believe to keep the, the, the the wine in the glass uh, in over the, the fireplace, full of oxygen and uh, uh, very hot place. In this way, you can uh, you can reach uh, the, the 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 problem of the wines. Uh, but if you leave the glass open uh, after a couple of days, three days, a week, uh, and the wine is still drinkable. It's just a question uh, of time. Be patient and never touch the wine when the wine is in the cellar. If the, the grapes, they were good, the wine will be good. Of course, of course. Um, so we are uh, approaching the Schedule well the slightly later scheduled end of um, of this uh, tasting, um, and uh, the next the next step of course is um, is a question is a Q and A, and I think that um, I oh think we are we going to taste uh, Barla? Oh oh we did we did but oh, okay I thought <laughs> well, okay I missed that. I just heard All right, let's get back. All right, you know, well, let's do a quick recap of Barla. Yeah, it wasn't verbally tasted. Yeah. I think. Okay. All righty. So, um, so the Barla. I know, I know uh, Dan, uh, Dan McDade, he's in uh, Washington, D.C., and he's a big Barla fan. <laughs> All right. So, Dave, here we go. Uh, so, the Barla. 
the Barlet is uh, most likely 100% um, uh, Barbera, although uh, frequently in the, in the text sheets for these wines, um, there are numerous biotypes, uh, which might be a question someone could ask in the Q&A period. Um, so these are the oldest vines in the property, uh, planted uh, in, the 19, in the late 1920s. Uh, very similar uh, winemaking. Um, I will say that uh, historically speaking, um, I have always loved this wine, but for me, it has been confounding um, and in a good way. Um, I think that, you know, I'm very lucky I'm old. I've been tasting stuff forever. And uh, one of the, the things that I enjoy most about tasting wine is tasting the same wine um, over many vintages. So as an example, um, Angelino Mole uh, in the Veneto uh, makes Garganaga. And um, he makes one wine called Pico. Now, when I had the Pico first, uh, it was skin, it was macerated on the skins. It's fermented in an amphora, and it was, uh, it suffered no sulfur addition. Um, and it produced a very heady, very dense, very rich, very complex, multi-layered wine. But it's the entry level wine. And maybe Angelino didn't necessarily need it to be like that, but tasting it so many vintages since that vintage, which would have been like the early 2000s, I've tasted it probably six or seven times since then. Now it is, again, without any manipulation, without any anything really, um, this is this vibrant, um, excited wine that is shimmery and, and palate freshening and palate stimulating. So for me, Barla, um, but so it's always been different. So <clears throat> obviously it's a trip along a learning curve to some sort of goal. The Barla, which I want well, probably one of the reasons why I, I appreciate the wines of Casa Carini um, and they're in kind of my, you know, my top wines is that they never, it never tastes the same. There are certain elements that carry through. Uh, the fruit tone, I think, um, always carries through. The, uh, the overall textural components has always carried through, but it's expressiveness. How loud the wine or quiet the wine is always changes um, so much. And um, even though it was a challenging vintage, um, this is one of my favorites that I've ever had. I really like this wine. Um, and, um, and I think uh, it has a long life ahead of it, personally. We, we, we hope for a long life. Yeah. <laughs> long life for the vineyard. We're in doing this. I remember uh, the first time I tasted. Uh, see, this has a little reduction. The, too. the first time I tasted Barla, it just blew me away. I couldn't believe I never tasted a Barbera like that. The 2019, the 18, uh, like this one is not the, the, the best vintage of, uh, of Barla, in my opinion. But. Uh, the, the, the Barla place is, 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 a, is a very special place, not just for us, for, but uh, for a lot of organisms, not just the human. Uh, our father found uh, a very special place. Uh, he bought this vineyard uh, more than uh, around 40 years ago. And... Uh, Right now, we are still uh, a lot of plant, uh, original plant from this plot, 100 years old. And uh, it's a very, very special place for us. It's, the, it's our best vineyard. Where does the name come from? It's a topographic name of the area. 
okay. on the map there is right Barla as well the neighbor they call this uh, um, natural amphitheater 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 uh, Barla yeah. We we bottle uh, we we will bottle uh, the 2017 at the end of this uh, week, and uh, I, I we we would like to to do an, another Zoom with that kind of vintage will be <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Very good. I'm up for that, and I'll even pay for the wine myself. I don't. <laughs> Um, all right. So, all right. I guess to, to, for me to kind of end my commentary or, you know, except for if someone wanted to ask me, uh, questions in the Q and a, um, so the, the story of these wines in many ways is simple. Um, it's a family that over multiple generations um, are stewards of their, of their land, of their landscape, of the place that they call home and have um, nurtured it and allowed it to grow in the way it would. And that is a big part of making, in, in quotes, natural wine. Um, is that the, that the place that the wine comes from is cared for and in a sense revered um, because um, plants, fruits, all these things are, are a direct result of what gives our whole planet life, which is the sun. Um, and so that's an important thing. The, I am so thankful, Guido and uh, Luisa, that uh, good stewardship of the land um, is your path that you have chosen. Um, and I believe that all that is written about your, your family and about your property, the books and all this, the, the research that your father has done over many, many years, in whatever way you can without you know, becoming a world traveler, um, you should seek to share um, these things. I know La Maliosa is, is, in the, is in the family feel, but you need, to, you need to share this with other people who may never get to drink your wine, but other winemakers, wine growers, especially, um, because it's just, uh, it's just, your wines are just amazing that they are so alive and so brilliant. Um, and I asked earlier, I'm gonna ask again, um, as my final question, um, you know, back in the day, it was said that natural wines, unsulfided wines, you know, couldn't age. And I'm, I know full well that that's a load of nonsense. I know that it's baloney, it's crap, it's anything you can come up with, any word, it does, it's not true because I have aged wines myself over at least uh, up to 10 years, wines made without sulfur and have seen them evolve over the time and seen them become uh, truly wonderful. And, and not the way conventional wines develop. You know, the thing I hate about, I love Michael Broadbent, but one of the things that I hated about his tasting notes was that he would taste a 50 year old Bordeaux Oh, still showing some vibrant fruit character and lovely floral notes. And now, really, who cares? So the wine is like holding on for dear life. Does that make it good? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. I have not tasted that many natural wines that are 50 years old, but they're not holding on for dear life to their fruit and their vitality and their living nature. They are fully out there. I mean, they like rip open the shirt to show their muscles or whatever else might be under there. That's the Morrissey of natural wine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so I ask again, do you have a library? Have you any of the wines made over however long it's been 
uh, stashed away where at some point you might try them again. Sorry, I, I, I lost a part of the, your question. Do you have old bottles in a library? Yeah. yeah. How far back do you go? Oh, we, we go back to more than 70 years old. And um, what is the oldest wine you have tasted from your, your library? 1947. Ah, well, why oh. not? <laughs> A special occasion of the the the, the um, we we celebrate the uh, the birthday of of our father opening a bottle of 1947. Ah, that is so. Four, how four was years. how was it? I was uh, <laughs> emotional. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> the the yeah no is a uh, it is uh, is unbelievable that. Uh, our ancestor, they they select the grapes uh, during uh, just after the Second World, and they they collect and they they conserve uh, in the cellar for a long long time. We don't have uh, all of the vintage from that uh, that times, but we have a, a very very old uh, library. Excellent, excellent. So yeah. I'll be taking a trip. Yeah, uh, to Piemonte. I, take, I, I will be uh, making travel plans. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, are, you are welcome. Uh, you are welcome at any time. <laughs> okay, so, um, so uh, that will conclude the formal part of our presentation. <laughs> uh, we're gonna move now into uh, Q&A and uh, really anyone who is participating here uh, can ask or be asked a question. I just had one quick question. Um, I know we sure in particular of the Barbera Hyatt's Miller. Um, and noticing, and Peter kind of touched upon this for a moment, but noticing like a little bit more of that ripeness and potential um, residual sugar. And um, I think it's quite balanced the wine, but I was curious if you were picking the Barbera significantly later or if you, um, if it has a product of some stuck fermentation or, or um, what could pass it, what, what, it, what it is, or if you were doing um, a little bit of drying or anything like that of the grapes. Uh, good question, but I have no answer about this. Uh, we, um, we never control the fermentation. I mean, we believe in natural fermentation and sometimes uh, to, um, to be complete, the fermentation, it takes more than one year. Uh, in my opinion, uh, 19, uh, 18, that, that vin this vintage, there is no sugar less, uh, but I should check the, 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 the analysis to, to, be, to be sure about this. Uh, some vintages, uh, we, we bottling with the sugar less, and we, we do, just for one reason, because we expect the vintage. And our, uh, our way to make wine is, uh, first of all, we expect the, the, the characteristic of the vintage. If the sugar is too high and the fermentation uh, stopped before, we expect this kind of uh, style. But our main goal is uh, complete the fermentation, but we can't do sometimes. When the sugar is too high, we respect the, 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 the sugar. And then do you let it just hang out and then it picks back up or do you make the choice to bottle? Or move to barrel. Or move to barrel. I can't understand the, the, the question. Could you? Um, could you so if it was a, a stuck fermentation, are you making the choice to move it to a barrel or are you um, letting it hang out and letting it eventually create fermentation again? Um, we work uh, to improve uh, and to help the fermentation uh, at the beginning of the fermentation. But uh, we, after a couple of weeks, uh, when the, where the fermentation um, can't protect 
anymore the wine against the volatile and many things. We fill up the barrel and we stop to oxygen the fermentation. Perfect. Thank you. Is a good answer? Yes, yes totally. very good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We just had a couple of people that had to leave, but they they were th thanking um, thanking you, uh, uh, Guido, uh, Louisa, and Peter for a very informative um, talk. So a lot of compliments. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So Thanks I don't think you. we have any other questions. Uh, certainly, um, if anyone has a question, they can just uh, ask it or unmute yourself. So I guess uh, we can um, we can go you guys can enjoy the rest of the wine <laughs> make sure you hang on to it i liked uh, peter what you said about hanging on to it for a couple of days because as you probably know these wines e evolve right so right they grow they are yeah. they're alive you know they're creatures peter, i have a, a suggestion for you yes. you were talking about the three-day test uh, you can try as well with the three weeks uh, test. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I will do that. Maybe I will do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. <sighs> and and just uh, uh, it's so something I, I just want to emphasize, and, and I know we have a uh, um, you know, a number of people from from the New England area. Um, I mean, as Peter, you kind of re reference, but. Um, Lorenzo Carino's wines, uh, of course, you know, Cabe Carini were, uh, um, let's say were, were available, I understand for, for fairly easily available, at least in Massachusetts up until whatever, you know, maybe five years ago or so. And, um, and certainly, uh, you know, my, my company is, is eager to get into, uh, Massachusetts, uh, I know, of course, you know, uh, you know, we have Brendan uh, with us today, uh, and I think you know Guido and Lu Louisa also, you know, would just really love to get back into New England. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I, you know, when I spoke, I spoke with, uh, you know, one of my last conversations with Lorenzo was about that. In fact, um, so um, you know. So it's just great to have to have you on board, and it's great, you know. I see Dan, you know, Dan in Washington D.C. and Kathleen is in uh, San Diego. She's a, a wine, actually, a winemaker herself, or vigneron in, um, in San Diego County. So it's great to have, um, you know, ha have you all uh, listening in. So enjoy the rest of the day. Yes, thank you so thank much, Sheila. So this is, uh, this is, a tr I just, I can't even, I do not have words. Um, I really don't have words. Um, this has been wonderful and the wines are beautiful and I'm just so happy that I'm able to participate. I just consider it the greatest honor ever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you thanks, all. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thanks. for the thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Okay. Grazie. Bye. 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 Bye.